pretty much always been a collector. I uh, had a collection of black memorabilia, which I eventually got tired of and sold because I found out that I could get a whole lot more money for the things than I had paid. And later, a friend of mine who had a collection asked me if I was sorry that I had sold that one. And then I said, yeah, I was, kind of. And he said, well, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to give you my collection, but you can't sell it. So he gave me his collection. And I still have most of the pieces from that. Sometimes I've given them away since I promised them I wouldn't sell them, but they're I ran into other collectors that collected that kind of stuff. And I could trade for African American art pieces, which I did. I then started collecting black images, and it didn't matter to me whether it was a black artist or a white artist. And in 19, I think it was 77, I used to take my lunch in the Civic Center and I walked by the Capricorn Asunder Gallery and there was a show featuring Sergeant Johnson and Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Lawrence Ferlinghetti was a beat poet from North Beach and the show was about the beats and Sergeant Johnson was part of that movement and that was my first exposure to Sergeant Johnson's work and I had never seen anything like it because he's so eclectic. There are paintings and sculpture, um, plaques, and I thought, wow, this is really nice. But I had no idea that you could collect that kind of thing. And so I started doing research, and the more research I did, I realized that I had seen his work before uh, at the Marin County Flea Market and I had liked the pieces and they were African American images but you know not knowing what things are worth or whether you should do it I just passed on them and I also realized that in 19 76, I had seen Sergeant Johnson carving a totem out of a, a, a tree trunk that had been cut down in the corner of the visitor on Eddie, and I didn't know who he was. I just put pieces together later on. And they moved that work to the corner of Golden Gate and uh, Webster. But it's, it's weathered to the point where you don't recognize what it, really what it is. So after that exposure, I started doing research. I, in 1990, I found a catalog of two centuries of African American art. And it was a show that David Driscoll had curated and had uh, put together to travel to various museums. And Again, I was amazed, but I also could tell from reading the caption that under some of the pieces that they were owned by mostly by museums, but also by individuals. So I thought, well, maybe I can do this. So I put out the word that I was looking for Sergeant Johnson's work. And I went to a a gallery in North Beach because I thought that's where I should start since that's where he had been. And the first person I talked to, the first gallery owner, told me, oh, you might as well be looking for Picassos. You're not going to find this stuff. I said, okay. But a dealer did call me because I put my name out there and he told me that he had two, two pieces and I went in and saw them and one was the cat. And it was $5,500, and that was the price of a new car at that time. So I thought, no, I don't know. The other piece was called The Lovers, and it was $1,500, and it was more 
in my price range, but you know, he told me a lot of people have difficulty with this because it's really subject, su suggestive. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything, so I said, okay, I, I probably won't get that one. But I thought about the cap, but I said, no, I'll get back to you. And so I, I walked out of the gallery and I took two steps past the, the door and a voice told me, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. So I went back in and I said, can you do a better price than the 5500 And he said, well, I can do 4500 And I said, okay. And then he says, good, good. And I said, but you'll have to take it in installments. <laughs> and I didn't know that you could do that, but he said, okay. And that's how I came to own the cat. And I started then thinking that I could have a Sergeant Johnson collection, not paying 4500 for each piece, but there were cheaper pieces. So it took me another three years, I think, before I found the next piece. When I bought the Cedar Home, I had a real reference point because I didn't know, this was pre-internet, and I couldn't go on like you can today and say African American artists and you'll get probably 95% of it African American artists that produce works. I then started buying and the, I bought a lot in 1992 to 1995 I bought a lot of things and it was the amount that I bought was determined by how much money I could raise and I leveraged a lot of things in order to do it and I bought some of my most important pieces. I think in 1995 I bought book works by Charles White, The uh, Open Gate and a piece that's not in the this, this show um, titled Fulfillment. And those are iconic works. They're, they're recognized as some of the best things that Charles White did. I also bought uh, the major tanner that is in the show. I bought that in 1995. So from 92 to like, say, 99, I bought the, the vast majority of what I have. In my early collecting efforts, I had this quirk that I wouldn't buy a watercolor um, because it was ephemera. It was um, not made to, to last, and I didn't think about preservation. But now, you know, I know, and I. For example, I don't have a Jacob Lawrence because I refuse to own a Jacob Lawrence print. If I own a Jacob Lawrence, I want a Jacob Lawrence painting. And I like missed out on some things because I had that attitude. But I still don't have a Jacob Lawrence print. <laughs> um, most of my works are figurative. I do have and love uh, abstractions. I, I started out and I, I could see that I was collecting like micro narratives of the, the greater uh, African American diaspora. Um, and each one of those paintings told something about the way black people lived in that period and, and the way the artist looked at the conditions during that period. I love narrative works. I have um, all total probably about 350 pieces in my collection. So what you're seeing in the exhibit is only one tenth of, of what I have. And I, out of the 350, I would say about 325 are 
figurative works. But, you know, there are some like the Alma Thomas that are a combination, and you'll see that in the exhibit, and that is absolutely one of my favorite pieces of all time. I just was totally floored by that painting when I first saw it. The Alma Thomas is a combination of figurative and abstractions, and I absolutely, absolutely love that piece. I had probably five minutes or less to make up my mind to, to buy that, that piece. And I did it. And it was just, to me, the most incredible rush ever. And I think the reason why I've not become a drug addict is because I get this rush when there's when I'm waiting for a piece to come up at auction. The adrenaline rush is incredible. And so I don't need drugs. I, this is my drug. And I can wake up in the morning and look at things that most people will never ever see. I can look at combinations of artists that, that even collectors do not have. When I started collecting, I, I knew I had to, to have a method, and so I would place ads in the newspaper, but it became increasingly more expensive to do that, and uh, because I think it was like $400 a pop, and you know, I could buy a work of art for $400, but I tried to leverage that, say, if if someone responded, they might have three or four different pieces for me to buy. Well, one uh, person responded, and her name was Pele de Lap. She was a, a California artist, and she had been a friend of Sergeant Johnson's, and so I went to her place up in Petaluma, and I purchased a piece from her uh, called uh, Mother and Child. And the way that I knew people who had Sergeant Johnson's work was that I had the 1971 catalog. And the 1971 catalog had pictures of some of the, the works that were in the show, but, and it had a list of donors at the back of, of the catalog, but it didn't match them up. So I had to look people up in the phone book and try to locate them, but by this time, you know, some of these people were dead and their children were the ones that had ended up with the works. So there was one name that I uh, wanted to investigate and I thought, well, I might not have a lot of trouble because it was an unusual uh, Polish or Russian name and it was Polyakov. So I looked up the five Polyakovs that were in California and none of them corresponded and then I would get a number where, you know, it was out of service. Why? The one number that was out of service was in Marin and that was the, the person who had a piece in that show. While I was talking to Pelle de la about my efforts and I asked her, do you happen to know a uh, uh, Polyakov family? And she said, I do, but I did, but I don't know where they are. And she said, I'll give you the name of somebody who might. So she gave me this other person's name, and I called her. And she says, yes, she, she had Sergeant Johnson's work, and I'm pretty sure that she had something in that collection. But I heard that she became ill and her family came uh, and closed up her apartment and took her back to some place near Chicago. And I said, oh good, then I'll, I'll look up Polyakov. And, and she says, you won't find her under Polyakov because her son was from a first marriage and it, it turns out his name, she said, I'll try to find his name for you. It turns out, I think his name was Nick Labanti. Mm -hmm. I 
then researched enough till I found a phone number for a person by that name. And I called the number and this lady answered and I asked if she, are you Mrs. Polyakov? And she said yes. And I said, did you loan a piece to a Sergeant Johnson show in 1971? And she says, yes. And I said, well, which piece was it? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, you mean, you don't know? Are you, I said, or you don't have any more? She said, I don't know. And she became kind of frustrated. And so she said, just a minute. And so she put the phone down. And her daughter-in-law came on the line. And I told her what I was looking for. And I asked, did you, uh, when you closed up her place, did she have a Sergeant Johnson uh, uh, sculpture? And she said, well, I don't know. She said, we did keep some figurines. And so I said, and then she said, well, the rest of the things we just donated to the Salvation Army or Goodwill. And I had visions of Salvation Army or Goodwill having a Sergeant Johnson piece on their shelves and somebody bought it for five dollars. And I, oh my God. So I said, well, can you go look at the figurines that you brought? With her? So she said, sure. So she went in and she looked and she says, uh, I, and I had asked her, are any of them bronze? And she came back and she said, well, there is a metal one. And I said, do you have it there? She said, yes. And I said, uh, is it a girl? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, does she have two holes in her body? And she said, yes, she does. And I said, does she have braids? And she said, yes, she does. And I said, is it signed? She said, well, let me look. And she said, I don't see any. I said, well, turn it over. And so she said, yes, here's the signature. And that was it. I had found it. And she, I said, well, can I buy it? She said, we have to wait till my husband comes home. And so it took him two days before he called me back. And he said, um, yeah, I guess I could sell it to you. You know, my mother has Alzheimer's and she doesn't really, really even know. And the money would come in handy. And so that's how I bought that piece. And I don't think I'll ever sell it. There was a point where a publisher was brought to my house by a friend of mine because she had been impressed with the collection and the publisher came here and she was impressed with the collection and she said, not only do I want to do a, a catalog of your collection, I have to do a catalog of your collection. So I thought, great. Um, and I waited and waited and a couple of weeks later I, I called my friend and I said, what's happening with, you know, the, the publishing house? And she said, well, someone told her that you weren't a collector, that you're a dealer. And I told her, well, you know that's not true and I know it's not true. and. You know, there's nothing wrong with being a dealer, but they were using it in the pejorative, and it was something that was to be used against me. It was like, well, how could you do this? How could you create this thing unless there was some other angle other than you sacrificing, you know, or to, to do it? And uh, they sent me a letter, and she said she was... Uh, Sorry, but they couldn't proceed because someone had told them that I was a dealer. And uh, that put a whole, me in a whole different light. Well, I want everyone to know that I'm not a dealer. I couldn't be a dealer and still have 350 plus works of art. If, if I had been, I, I would have a whole lot more money in my bank account than I have. So I... I I'm a collector. I'm a collector who doesn't collect anymore, but I am a collector. I'm f fairly familiar with uh, the collect collections of other African American collectors, and there are differences in my collection 
from some of them I have collected in depth. I am not satisfied with having one trophy piece by a major artist. I would like to have a number of pieces that show the full range of their work, hopefully over their lifetime. I have 32 Sergeant Johnson works. I have five Joseph Kersey's. I have two Tanner paintings. I have four Charles White works. And that's that's been my philosophy. And the the basis of it is that this is our, our cultural patrimony. And I think that even the the smallest work by you know a major artist is is worth collecting if I like it. And the smallest work, if that's the only piece that I can find by someone who isn't recognized, is is what I aim to collect. And I usually didn't buy anything if I didn't like it. I like things that were painterly. I did shy away initially from buying works by naive artists because they were already recognized by the establishment as being uh, worthy of, of, of collection and people like Heyward Oubre who were professors of art no one really cared about his work um, they do now but we've all been educated now and I as a collecting philosophy I always hope that if I bought a work that it would be worthy of being in the ca in a catalog raisonné, um, and I think I've achieved that pretty much. I don't think you could have a Charles White retrospective unless you had the works that I have in the show, and I don't think you could have a Haywood Oubre retrospective unless you have the works that I have, and that's the case for a few other artists that I have, and especially if I have fifteen or. 20 pieces, which I do have from other artists, you just couldn't, it wouldn't be anywhere near complete.